Founder fans, welcome to this week's uh, Founder of the Day week in review. Thank you so much for coming. Clearly I am not ready to talk, but I got my head in the game now. So, most of you probably know what's going on, but for those of you who don't, this is the week in review. Well, I would talk about the last seven founders who had Founders of the Day this week. So we're going to get into it pretty quick this week. Uh, I know people are trickling in. Thank you so much. Make sure you hit like. I really appreciate that. And we'll get right on with it. So we will start with last Thursday, July 9th. And I discussed a young man named Jonathan Williams Austin, who I always mess up his name because he's got three first names. Uh, Jonathan Williams Austin was one of two uh, young men who graduated Harvard and became the first two law clerks of one John Adams. Now you probably recognize the name John Adams because he's John Adams. But this was back in the 1760s uh, when he was a younger lawyer. So I do want to mention Jonathan William Austin always kind of had a bad attitude. When he was in Harvard, he actually led a revolt against the rules of Harvard that him and he and his fellow students didn't care for. So they had a revolt against Harvard and their masters, um, and he got in trouble and got expelled. And he was almost not permitted to graduate, but he did graduate because he was smooth talker and he got some of the wealthier people in the, Boston, the greater Boston region to support him. So he was able to get back into Harvard, graduate, and then became a law clerk of the one John Adams. Now, when the American Revolution broke out, John Williams Austin, uh, again, those three first names, I just keep mixing them up, <laughs> but his name is John William Austin, uh, Williams, plural, uh, he joined the fight, and he joined the Continental Army, and he was uh, at uh, in Boston when George Washington arrived, and John Adams, who was now in Philadelphia doing Continental Congress things, wrote a letter of recommendation for John Williams Austin uh, to George Washington and said, hey, Washington, uh, well, he doesn't say he's the best guy in the world because at one point he had actually accused Austin of stealing office supplies, essentially. Um, so, but he did call him, I have some a few uh, quotes here that I, I quote here that I really like. Uh, he called Williams a youth of great abilities, but that he also suffered certain follies because he just was up to mischief quite often. And this didn't help him when he got into the Continental Army because he was given an officer's position. He was a major, and he went through the war, and uh, not the whole war. Early in the war, he was in New York at White Plains, and while at White Plains, he was instructed not to destroy any private property if you didn't have to. In fact, everyone was given that instruction, but, well, John Williams Austin ordered his men to burn down a courthouse and several other houses. And... This didn't go along very good. In fact, he was dishonorably discharged from the Continental Army. Six months later, he would be recommended. Uh, this is, and this is in 1776 uh, still. Pretty early in the war. Uh, he, seven months later, he was considered for reinstatement. In fact, Henry Knox recommended to George Washington that he be reinstated. No, I apologize. William Heath, not Henry Knox. William Heath recommended to George Washington that... John Williams Austin be reinstated, but Washington wrote back essentially saying, does he still drink too much? And the answer Washington got was not to his liking, and he was not invited back into the army. Now, he Williams, uh, John Williams Austin was able to redeem his reputation a little bit because he went and, uh, went back home to Boston, became a lawyer, talked to his fancy rich friends, and by 1778, he was the one who gave the annual oration in memory and commemoration of the Boston Massacre. Ever since the Boston Massacre happened, someone gave an oration the following year, and these were very important in the beginning. Uh, now, eight years later, the war was on. The British had already evacuated Boston. It wasn't as meaningful, but it was, in a fashion, um, a way to keep patriotic morale up. In fact, in, in some sense, they were trying to tell the people of Boston, hey, I know we kicked the British out of Boston, but, like, they're still in New York, and New York sent people to help us. 
we should probably keep helping out. <laughs> In so many words, it was more ra da 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 uh, fanfare and pageantry than that, but uh, by all accounts, he did a very good job. Now, he was still a young man, but unfortunately, John Williams Austin dies kind of suddenly, not too long after this. Uh, it seems likely that his alcoholism played a pretty big part in this, but there really, we don't know exactly what killed him. That is a little bit of an assumption on my part, but based on the conversations the letters, the correspondence I had read earlier in the week, it seems pretty likely. <laughs> uh, but again, so his story just kind of ends. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, unless there are any questions, of course, I will pop over. Not yet. You guys usually bring me questions a little later in the day, so that's great. Um, thank you again for hitting like. I really appreciate it. It brings more people. Uh, YouTube tells more people about these conversations that we are having. So, on Friday... Uh, as most of you know, I was writing Federalist Fridays. I was reviewing one Federalist paper a week for 85 weeks so from October 2018 until about two or three weeks ago I was doing this. Um, I am about to start doing Anti-Federalist Fridays uh, this week. But last week, I did one more prequel to the Federalist, as I call it, and is the State House Yard speech by uh, um, James Wilson. Now, I made a video about James Wilson like two or three weeks ago. Actually, it's by far my most successful video. Most of my videos get like 30 to 50, maybe 100 views, and that one got 5,000 <laughs> somehow. So, thanks for watching it and subscribing, because probably that's how you found me. I'm not going to go into James Wilson. If you want to learn about that, please go back and watch that video. But what I will say is the State House Yard speech was just, Wilson signed the, the uh, United States Constitution. And just about three weeks later, here he is, at, in front of the Pennsylvania State House, what we now know as Independence Hall, where the document was signed in Philly, giving a speech in favor of it. And the reason is, anti-federalists began writing papers about how terrible the Constitution was almost immediately. <laughs> like, literally a week later, they started coming out. Uh, people really didn't love that they met in secret, and instead of just revising the Articles of Confederation, they wrote a brand new government, and it's super consolidated. Yay! So, James Wilson, who was there and, and very much in favor of this Constitution, uh, felt it his obligation to give the State House Yard speech, where he essentially reviewed mm, uh, broadly, you know, it's mm, not very, not that long, but broadly reviewed most of the points that the Federalists would eventually really, uh, the Federalist Papers would go into a lot of de depth on. Blah, 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 blah. Easy for me to say. Um, and he does this in the State House Yard. Uh, what's really interesting about this, actually, is that most of the people, who, the Anti-Federalists were publishing papers under pseudonyms. The Federalists published under, under Publis. It was not under the names Alexander Hamilton and James Madison and John Jay. It was under the name Publis. Uh, many of the Anti-Federalists did the same. The Sentinel... Uh, Brutus, Cato, Federal Farmer, all sorts of pseudonyms. But James Wilson stood up and said, No, I'm James Wilson, and this is how I feel. And it's really uh, kind of astonishing that he did so, that he was so courageous, because he gave the speech in public, in front of people who he knew disagreed with him, and then printed it, and it was published in all of the colonies. So... It really was the first Federalist paper, though it was very unofficially the Federalist paper, because they hadn't even come up with Federalist and Anti-Federalist as names yet. That's how su This is three weeks after they sign it, which makes it only like two and a half weeks after they published it. So, there you go. A Statehouse Yard speech, James Wilson stands up for what he believes in. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to go too deep into that. Um, what I will do is check and see if anyone has any questions. Not yet. Thank you for watching. Um, and I'm going to go to Saturday, where I talked about William Livingston. William Livingston is a fascinating character. He is one of the Livingston family of New York. But he's not famous for being from New York. So, he does grow up in New York. Uh, he has several siblings who end up becoming other founders, as well as cousins and nephews and nieces and sons-in-laws who are founders, and, and a daughter. I, I, I'll get to that. Um, he's born in Albany, where the Livingston, most of the Livingston family was from. Uh, he grows up there, 
And then he goes down to New York City where he studies law, begins practicing law. And then with uh, two other people, he starts a newspaper, uh, kind of a newspaper, more like a periodical. I don't, I wouldn't know how to say it. They only published a few issues. And the reason is, well, apparently they were going to make a college in New York. King's College. Spoiler alert, they do make King's College. We now know it as Columbia. But he didn't really want that college because, well, the Livingstons were Presbyterian. And this college was going to be Anglican, and they were nervous that if there's a university, they will have to send an Anglican bishop from England to run the university, or at least oversee the religious aspects of the university, because education was still very much tied to religion at this time, uh, although that would change throughout the revolution. It was, I actually had a conversation with my friend Tom yesterday uh, and was discussing how the American Revolution wasn't just a political revolution, it was also a social revolution in many ways, one of which was the, the views of religion loosened up a lot. I mean, there was a Catholic that signed the Constitution. Imagine that. <laughs> um, um, anyway, uh, at this point in time, uh, about two decades before the revolution started, people were not necessarily happy, and William Livingston tried to prevent uh, this Anglican University from coming. Now, that did happen, and he got over it. He does end up moving to New Jersey, and this ends up becoming a very wise move, because once the American Revolution happens, William Livingston has already made his way up as a lawyer in New Jersey. He's made some money and a name for himself, and he's in uh, the, the um, New Jersey uh, Assembly when the Assembly gets banned by the king, and they have these... Uh, uh, I can't get words out today, I apologize. The committees of safety that essentially are a shadow government that take over the separate colonies. And he's part of that, and he helps take over New Jersey, and then he's sent to the Second Continental Congress. And while he's at the Second Continental Congress, well, what do you know? There's a vote for independence coming up, and he supports independence, but he doesn't vote for it. Instead, he realizes they're about to pass independence, so he runs back to New Jersey real quick, like many people did, uh just before the vote for independence and after the vote for independence. In fact, there's several men who voted for independence that would not sign the declaration because it would take a month before they actually signed in August. So, William Livingston, actually, his brother, Robert Livingston, is one of those people who, from New York who stuck around, voted for independence, was on the committee of five that wrote the declaration, and then left and didn't sign it. Anywho, Robert Living, uh, I'm sorry, William Livingston runs back to New Jersey and says, hey, let's make this government thing happen. They're going to make us independent. New Jersey makes a government, and who do they vote for as president of, I'm sorry, governor of New Jersey? The first governor of the state of New Jersey is William Livingston, and he's there for the next uh, 15, 17 or so years throughout the war and throughout the founding until the Constitution is written and signed. In fact, this man would go to the Constitutional Convention as governor of New Jersey, and he would uh, help author and uh, sign, um, uh, sign the United States Constitution. Uh, he, he shortly thereafter did retire. He was aging pretty far into his life at this point, and he did retire. Uh, he would uh, not... He was... He was offered the position of foreign minister to go to Netherlands, but he declined that position and instead chose to retire. And I do want to note that his daughter was Sarah Livingston, who we know now as Sarah Livingston Jay. We talked about her not so long ago in one of these live videos. Uh, she married John Jay and was instrumental not only in trying to win the respect of Spain when she went with her husband to Spain, uh, but became friends with Benjamin Franklin in France. And during George Washington's first administration, when her husband was the first chief justice of the Supreme Court, uh, his daughter, Sarah, uh, was in charge of throwing the dinners that most of the political maneuvering were completed at. Uh, in fact, she has a famous book she kept of all the people who visited her house, and it is a laundry list of fascinating founders. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm seeing here, I did forget to mention that William Livingston did go to the First Continental Congress also, and he did sign the... Articles of Association, or the Continental Association, that launched the boycott, started the revolution in the first place. Uh, William Livingston, probably a thousand things I left out about this gentleman. Let's see if you had any questions. Not yet. Thank you for watching, though.
<laughs> if you have questions, let me know. Um, as always, I'm talking very fast. I'm going to sip my coffee real quick. It is a hot coffee today, so I'm going to sip it very gently. Weird. It's weird that I stared into the camera. I won't do that again. Anywho, let's talk about John Morton. John Morton is a fascinating character that we just kind of forget. <laughs> um, as with many of the founders I talk about, but Morton was actually fairly high on the list of founders. That is, until he passed away. He is famous for being the first signer of the Declaration to die. But, Morton started out in his family business, surveying. Now, surveying during the American Revolution was one of the best ways, if not the best way, for a person of middling background to exceed their position and move up into the elite of society. For example, George Washington, although he did inherit quite a good amount of land, that was because his brothers had died, he was not the oldest brother and wasn't supposed to inherit all this land, so Washington made a name for himself surveying. Uh, furthermore, so did uh, Peter Jefferson, father of Thomas Jefferson. Surveyor, worked very hard at it, was respected. Uh, he also died fairly young, but because of his work as a surveyor, his son was able to uh, excel and move up into the upper echelons of society. And the reasons for this are twofold. You got paid pretty well as a surveyor because you were going out into the woods usually by yourself, where there was not just wild animals, like scary wild animals, but uh, Native Americans who didn't necessarily want you uh, treading on their property. And if you went too far out, the French, who like really didn't want you there, but they were usually a little more polite about it because they didn't want to accidentally start a war, which George Washington did. We're not going to get into that, though. <laughs> um, but uh, my point is, not only were you getting paid for this dangerous thing, it's not the best pay in the world, but it was good pay, uh, but usually, you would also get to keep some of the land you surveyed. And property was the name of the game, especially in places like Virginia and Pennsylvania, where the land was theoretically endless. They didn't really know how big the United States was. Uh, there were ships that had made it around to the other side, but they hadn't like, really comprehended it that well at the, that point. So anyway, John Morton goes into surveying, and this works out, because by the time he's in his early 30s, He's elected, he's from Pennsylvania, and he's elected to the Pennsylvania uh, Colonial Legislature. And he's there for a while, uh, and then, well, the Stamp Act gets passed. And it's like, oh no, this is terrible. So, they had the Stamp Act Congress in 1765, the often underappreciated Stamp Act Congress, nine years between the before the First Continental Congress. And people from many states, uh, the exact number escapes me, not all the states were there, but most of them were there. They met in New York, uh, had a problem, discussed the problem wrote down their grievances, sent three letters, one to the king, one to the House of Lords, and one to the House of Commons. And their grievances were addressed and everything was cool. Except for the fact that Parliament said, we're going to get rid of these laws, but we could do whatever we wanted. We're not going to, but we could. That ends in a war ten years later, if you're not familiar. Um, and I bring it up because John Morton was one of the people sent from Pennsylvania. He made his way up in society to be sent to the Stamp Act Congress. He went to New York and helped resolve this problem and came back. So, 10 years later, when there's some more problems, uh, they say, hey John, why don't you go uh, help fix this? So he does, he goes to the first Continental Congress where he helps create and signs the Continental Association with the aforementioned William Livingston. <laughs> and he creates the United States. Wait, I skipped a part. He starts the boycott that the king doesn't like and the war happens. So there's a second Continental Congress where he, John Morton, is sent to that. And he goes and he helps to create, well, there's a vote on independence and John Morton is kind of undecided. So Pennsylvania is split and you have Benjamin Franklin and John Adams trying to sort things out. And John Morton, he wants to vote for independence, but his constituents that elected him to the position far and wide do not want independence. But Morton is there to represent their best interests, if not exactly what they say, you know, and this is an idea that people really held on to at the time, and we don't really expect this of our politicians anymore, like, if you, and I don't want to talk about modern politics, but generally speaking, if you vote for one party and the other party wins, you don't expect them to represent you. 
But back then you did, and they expected to represent all of their constituents. And he really thought what was in their best interest was independence. So John Morton did vote for independence. And then he did sign the Declaration of Independence. And then unfortunately, he got sick. And we're not entirely sure exactly what killed him, but less than a year later, in early 1777, he does die. And he still has a lot of anger directed at him, even on his deathbed, from his constituents. And there's a quote here I'd like to read. Not his last words, but some of his last words on his deathbed. Speaking to his constituents who were so mad at him, he said to his friend, Tell them they shall live to see the hour when they shall acknowledge it to have been the most glorious service I ever rendered to my country. It's a fascinating quote from a man on his deathbed who voted for the Declaration and signed the Declaration of Independence despite his constituents' desires. And he literally said on his deathbed, they'll see. <laughs> they'll see. I was right. They'll realize I was right. And... I like to think they did. Most of most people seem to. Maybe not all of them. I mean, back then, people held grudges like they do today. So not all of them, probably. But most of them, sh assuredly, uh, saw... Uh, gave a thumbs up to John Morton. And if you have not, please give a thumbs up on this video. It really helps. Anyway, shameless plug. Let's continue with Monday. On Monday, and uh, I don't see any questions coming up. I did just check. I don't see any questions yet. 21 minutes in, we're moving pretty fast this week. Probably because the Federalist was really short. Um, but some of the people I wrote about this week are fascinating, and we will assuredly spend a little extra time on them. For, exact, for example, John Holt. Now, I had heard the name John Holt before I really started looking into it, but I, I didn't know a ton about him. Uh, if you heard the scream, it was just a kid. Don't worry, no one's everyone's fine. <laughs> John Holt... I was born in Williamsburg, Virginia, which we know is the capital of Virginia at the time. Now, Colonial Williamsburg, really sweet historic preservation. Um, anyway, John Holt uh, grows up in Williamsburg. He starts a general store, for lack of a better term, uh, and he makes a pretty good name for himself. Uh, he's even elected briefly as governor, I'm sorry, mayor of Williamsburg for a year. And then he, you know, it's a one-year term, and then it's over, and he realizes, like, he's not making enough money to keep his store afloat, things aren't really going so swimmingly, so he decides to change careers, and, and does a pretty sweeping change of careers, because he moves to Connecticut. And he meets up with a man named James Parker. James Parker was a sometimes partner of Benjamin Franklin. At this point, in the 1750s, uh, Benjamin Franklin was already retired in his mid-40s, already retired, had franchises of printing shops and printing presses throughout the colonies. He was essentially the first person to franchise, uh, and I've written articles about that in the past. Um, one of the many things Benjamin Franklin was the first to do. So he... Uh, the New York press, he didn't. He kind of franchised. He essentially franchised this guy, James Parker. And James Parker also was trying to franchise out in Connecticut. And the he started a paper called the Connecticut Gazette. And the first person he, he worked with for the Connecticut Gazette was Benjamin Meekum, who was the nephew of Benjamin Franklin. Now, Meekum, his story is very interesting. I was actually considering making a video about it this week, so I'm not going to spoil it right now, but... Uh, let's just say he's not very good at being a printer and kind of bails. So James Parker is left with now, he's running a press in New York and has his other press in Connecticut. And who shows up but John Holt. And John Holt has a letter of introduction from a friend. They get along swimmingly. And he essentially leases this place out in Connecticut to John Holt. John Holt starts printing the Connecticut Gazette. Uh, and that becomes kind of, you know... A little patriotic newspaper, but this is still during the French and Indian War, so nothing too crazy goes on there. But he and Parker are granted control of running the post from, uh, f essentially through Connecticut, almost all of Connecticut. I forget the exact two cities, but 
more or less through Connecticut on the road, the the only road, <laughs> the main road from New York to Boston. Uh, and they hire riders to go back and forth. Um, now, the stamp... I'm sorry, I skipped ahead. Eventually, they both kind of give up on Connecticut. Uh, Holt wants to move to New York where he can write a more influential paper. And Parker is spending most of his time there working on a more influential paper. So they both start working on the same paper for a while, and then Holt breaks off and builds his own press. So John Holt makes his own press, and he has a newspaper that changes names several times. Many, many times. Uh, but it's most commonly known as the New York Journal or General Advertiser. It's a long name, and I don't know why they put or in there, because it's one name, the New York Journal or General Advertiser? It's very strange, but that's how they did back then. He starts New York General Advertiser, and then Great Britain passes, or I should say Parliament, passes the Stamp Act. And suddenly, every time you're printing any paper, you gotta stamp it. And this is bad news for printers. Really bad news, because it's a lot of money. So you have some guys, like John Holt, who openly refuse to put a stamp on their paper. And because of this, it's about the time that the Sons of Liberty are becoming popular. And yes, there were Sons of Liberties in places that were not Boston, including New York City. New York City's Sons of Liberty were very important and pretty violent. And they really liked John Holt because he didn't take no guff from that government. And he was he refused to stamp. I shouldn't have done the pantomime of stamping. He refused to stamp his papers. So, he became the de facto publisher of the New York Sons of Liberty. So anytime they had anything they wanted to promote, or pamphlets they wanted to hand out, or bills they wanted to post or take down, they generally went to John Holt. It's not 100% of the case, uh, because there were many people in the Sons of Liberty and several printers in New York, and Sometimes someone tasked with printing something would go to their friend who was a printer instead of John Holt. But generally, he was the printer. Uh, the fi the darling of the uh, Sons of Liberty publishing scene, if you will. Now, this is good until the British come. Because shortly into the war, in August of 1776, well, the British bring the might of the British army on their ships, and the Navy, I suppose, to New York and invade it. So, John Holt, like, grabs all his stuff and tr and runs away and leaves most of his stuff, but brings, like, most of his press to, um, uh, Kingston. I believe he went to, yes, Kingston, New York. And he starts printing revolutionary pamphlets there. And then the British come to Kingston, so he gets all his printing press and gathers up all his stuff, and he runs north to Poughkeepsie. And he spends the remainder of the war and the remainder of his life in Poughkeepsie. He lived uh, about to about 70 years old, but he dies in 1784, right about the time like the war is officially over. So he does spend the rest of his life there printing uh, revolutionary sentiment and his New York Journal or General Advertiser. <laughs> uh, so that is John Holt, a fascinating guy. Um, his son actually stayed in Williamsburg this whole time and was an important printer also. I didn't write about that. I couldn't really fit into the article. I, I try not to make the articles too long or anything like that. But uh, if you guys have any questions, let me know. Um, I'm going to move on. If you don't, I'm going to take a quick sip of this because I am talking a lot. Alright, and now... We are going to talk about Michel Alain Cartier de Lotbiniere. I assume is how it's pronounced. I took some French in high school, and I kind of get how things are pronounced, but I like I, I can barely pronounce half the English words. So <laughs> sorry. Um, Lotbiniere is an interesting character, and I actually, you know, when I when I write the articles, I, I put them on Facebook and Twitter every day too, and I, I got some pushback from someone on some of the things I wrote about him here. Um, I think a lot of the disagreement this gentleman had, uh, who, who seems to be putting together a fascinating, uh, uh, I'm going to retweet it out later. I didn't have a lot of time to go through it, and I wanted to make sure it was as good as it looks before I put it out. Um, but essentially a um, docu-space, a, uh, a, a search engine 
I'll, uh, the word I'm looking for is website with lots of information you can search through about French Canada during the 18th century. Um, and this gentleman, he, I wasn't very, I was kind of vague about a lot of his earlier life because I wanted to get to the revolution because when people read my articles, that's what usually what you're coming for. Uh, and so I did breeze through a lot of it and he, uh, I, I, I don't think I was specific enough for his taste. Um, for example, uh, he grew up in a super wealthy family in France, New France, AKA Canada. So, um, he, I, I called him a respected constructor of military works, uh, because he became an engineer who was constructing military works for the French army, uh, before and into the French and Indian war. And, uh, he said he wasn't very respected, and this guy pointed out that his friends would make fun of him and stuff, but uh, I called him respected because, and this is due to him having relatives being governor, I'm sure, but he was chosen to fortify the city of Quebec. So whether or not he was a great engineer, maybe not, but he was given a very important task. Furthermore, during the French and Indian War, he was the one who built a certain fort called Fort Ticonderoga. And if you are a fan of the American Revolution, which I'm assuming you are because you're half an hour into this conversation, <laughs> um, that's a really important fort to the American Revolution. And when I realized this was the gentleman, I didn't know a ton about him, and this is when I realized he was the gentleman who built that, that's why I researched his life. Now, did he do a good job with Fort Ticonderoga? I don't know because it was destroyed several times, and the one that's there now is a recreation. Uh, but, you know, it was used, so it had to be okay. And it was an extremely strategic location, uh, which is why I feel he was at least somewhat respected to be given the task of building a fort in this very strategic location. So let's get to it. Now, he was a landowner. You know what? I'm going to run through his life real quick, and then I learned a lot about uh, the way property ownership worked in France, and that might sound boring, but I'm, I think I can, it took me a long time to figure it out, so I think I can explain it real quick and make it a little fun. Um, now, uh, sorry, the American Revolution breaks out, no, I'm sorry, the French lose the, the French and Indian War, and Britain takes over Canada, New France becomes Canada, and these are Catholics, and one of the reasons that New England didn't really like what, you know, started the revolution is like, the king afterwards said, the king of England said to these French people, you can keep being Catholic, it's cool. And for many of the still heavily Protestant people in New England, it, it wasn't it wasn't that cool. <laughs> um, but the king's attitude makes a lot of sense. He said, you guys are now in England, I'm not going to kick you all out, you're running this land. Like, keep trading furs, you're doing a great job, I'll leave you alone if you just pretend to be British. And like, they were like, we, oui, we, oui, and that's essentially how it went. Except for some of the very wealthy people, because as you might remember, the king issued the proclamation of 1763. And this proclamation drew a line that essentially ran up the um, uh, uh, mountains, uh, the um, Appalachian mountain range, and then up through the Adirondacks. And it said, colonists, you stay where you are, don't go on this side of the line, we're going to let the Native Americans live there. Again, sounds really reasonable, but uh, as we've discussed, many people, especially in Virginia and other southern states, really wanted that land that they thought they had access to in the Ohio Valley, and that is one of the unspoken reasons, as I recently said, as we talked about last week in the Declaration of Independence, they leave this out, but that is one of the main reasons a lot of people in the South really turned against the king. Uh, Lot Benair had a similar situation because it the proclamation line basically cut through modern-day New York. I, I am, like, just over the line. FYI. Fun fact. Um, but part of the Adirondacks is cut out, and it just so happens that Lot Benair owned land in that part of the Adirondacks. And he said to the king, he actually went to London and was like, hey... Can I just get access to this land? It's like right on the other side of the line. It's not a big deal. Just give me this land. And the king was like, no, but, well, I shouldn't say the king, parliament, or better yet, the board of trade, which is essentially a committee, uh, offshoot of parliament, 
Uh, they said no, but they were nice enough to say, we'll give you other land up here further north in Canada. And La Pinier was basically like, no, it's cold enough in upstate New York. <laughs> like, no thanks. You know, the growing season's that much shorter, I'll lose this much money. Uh, and the Board of Trade said, take it or leave it. And, you know, Lopney was like, nah, fine. You got to grumble, 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 and left. And he was super angry at the British. What do you know, ten years later, the American Revolution breaks out, uh, and Lapinier really wants France to join the war on the side of the Americans, for a very selfish reason. He wants to go back to being France. The French were much cooler. Even though, again, this land he owned was technically in British territory the whole time, because New York was British territory, that's not the point here. <laughs> um, uh, he really wanted France to come join the war and just get back to being New France. The good old days were really, really good old days. He ends up going to France, and the French, who are not yet joining the war, say, I'll tell you what, La, La Pinier, go to Boston and hang out and see what you can see and then send us back information. Essentially, go be a secret agent. Go spy on the, Brit on the Americans and see if you think they can win the war and if it's worth us fighting with them and, like, how much they want Canada. Because remember, at this point, the Americans had gone into and were just being kicked back out of Canada. Well, he goes there, and he's not a very good spy. He tells everyone right away what he's there for. Uh, and then about a year later, he gets recalled back to France. And he doesn't come back. He spends about a decade in France uh, trying to negotiate for his property back. In 1784, just after the war ends, he actually is the first person... Who, who is Canadian-born, who is given the title of Marquis, which is a term of royalty, uh, 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 not royalty, but a, a nobility. I, I mean, the Marquis de Lafayette, for example, was nobility, and he was promoted to nobility. Now, I mentioned this gentleman on Twitter who, came, who came, uh, gave me some uh, grief, we'll say, about uh, calling him the only Canadian given that title. He had mentioned that there was another family that also had that title in Canada. My retort was, well, the first Marquis moved to Canada and his children inherited that title. Yes, they were Canadian born and given that title, but Lapinier was the only Canadian born person who then went to France and was given the title. Anyway, had to defend myself a little. <laughs> Just to be clear, although like I did say on Twitter, we were splitting hairs. And it, yeah, Either way, really fascinating, really cool. So Lapinier comes back and wants to go back to all this property he owns in, in Canada. And uh, now that the revolution's over, the British are not really happy with the Americans. And they're like, really not really happy with this guy who was giving them grief before the revolution and then helped get France on board with the revolution, and they were like, you are not welcome. <laughs> and he said, but like, all oh, my land, blah de blah de blah And they said, uh, okay, you can come back for a few months and sell your property. And that's what he did. Mostly to his son. Uh, and, and interestingly enough, his, his son would become important, and then his granddaughter would marry another man who inherited the title of Marquis de Lapinier. I guess you could marry into the title. Um, that guy was, and I forget his name, I would probably refer to him as Lapinier. That gentleman is the first person to like take photographs of the, uh, uh, not the Parthenon, but ancient Athens, essentially. The Agropolis, that's it. Uh, and then his son, so Lapinier's great-grandson, would go on to be one of, an extremely important person to the development of nationalizing Canada. Because again, they were a British colony for a little while. Technically, they were a dominion of Britain until 1982. <laughs> um, and they still have the Queen is still their chief executive, theoretically. Like, she's still on their money. Um, which a lot of Americans don't seem to realize. Uh, though, of course, she has next to nothing to do with... I mean, at this point, the British monarch has nothing to do with anything. <laughs> but, um, uh, La, like I said, love. Lot Benier's grand, grandson uh, did a, just a ton of things in uniting all of Canada between the French and English-speaking parts and all this. 
Um, and I got a little off topic. So Lapineer would go back to New York City and spend his last few years of his life there after he sold his property um, and then died in the yellow fever pan epidemic in 1798. Wow, 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 wow. So I learned a lot about Sanguineer. Ah, oh, man. I, I don't know how to pronounce it. I am going to uh, bring it up which I know is super unprofessional, and I should know it. Um, uh, but I am doing this because I need to read the word of their system that they used. Essentially, what they had was a manor system. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to find it. Sanguineer, I think. Let's see. Sanguineer system, New France. Yeah, I don't know how to pronounce this. <laughs> um, sig, signorial, signorial system of New France. If this were a pre-made video, I'd put the word up here. S-E-I-G-N-E-U-R-I-A-L. So essentially, this it was essentially a serf system. Now, serfs had been eliminated in Europe by this point in a great fashion because they found the New World and were exporting slaves to the New World and that type of work could be done by slaves in the New World instead of having serfs, which were more or less slaves to the land in Europe for centuries. Uh, in, in New France, before it was Canada, when it was New France, and even after it was Canada, they had this system, which was basically a manor system, not too dissimilar from what they had in New York with people like Philip Schuyler in New York, where People would come, they, they would get people to move there, and one person would own the land. And more or less, they would come up with these deals where you, you rented the land. It was like co-ownership between the lord of the manor, uh, who would be Lapineer, or one of his counterparts, and your regular, everyday Canadian. And Lapineer, or his counterparts, would split his property into plots and sell it to people who would move there and build a house and work the land. From there, Lapineer would, uh, the, or the lord of the manor, was expected to build a mill right in the middle. And the people would work their land, go to the mill to grain their grains, and give usually one out of ten or, or up to one out of fourteen bushels of their grain to the manor, and the lord would then use that to sell it abroad to make a profit for himself and get very wealthy, but also to bring money into the economy so that these people working the land could have a community. There, I explained it very quickly. That is essentially how New France worked. Let's see, did I lose all of you at this point? No, okay, you guys are still here. Some of you, okay. <laughs> Thanks anyway. I know it's not the most interesting thing in the world, but I put a lot of research into it, so I hope you guys... Um, I, I had to bring it up. <laughs> like, it took me a long time to, like, I'm reading a lot of French words and looking them up, and, like, so to put that brief summary together took, like, three hours of my life. But I do it because it's fun, and I love it. So we're down to the last person, which is great, because I'm starting to get hot. Like, I, like I've told you guys before, i got to turn off my AC to get this far. Um, Eliezer Oswald is a really interesting character. I'm going to take one quick sip. So, Eliezer Oswald uh, immigrated to North America as a teenager. He settled in Connecticut, but then joined the Revolutionary War. Now, he was a young man, and he joined up with Benedict Arnold. And I know Benedict Arnold has terrible connotations nowadays, but... Early in the war, he made a very important name for himself as a general, and Eliezer Oswald was with him right at the beginning. In fact, he joined Benedict Arnold and Ethan Allen when they took the aforementioned uh, Fort Ticonderoga early in the war, where essentially some people from Vermont and some people from Connecticut invaded New York, which caused quite a stir down in Philadelphia at the Continental Congress. Like, what do you mean you invaded New York? <laughs> What are you talking about? We're trying to get the British out of Boston. Why are you invading New York? Now, in hindsight, it was a great move. Uh, it was a very easy to take the fort. Everyone was asleep. 
uh, there was barely any violence, and they had this very strategically located fort. He, Oswald would then follow Arnold through his famous, as a volunteer, with people like Aaron Burr, again, not the best company necessarily, uh, up through Maine. And they went through the trek through the Maine wilderness up to Quebec. At Quebec, Richard Montgomery was shot in the face, Benedict Arnold was shot pretty early, and Eliezer Oswald was also wounded and taken prisoner, and held as a prisoner for all, over a year, just over a year, about an extra week. When he was finally released, he was given command of artillery. He had impressed many people, and he was named an officer, and he was put in command of uh, Charles Lee's artillery. Now, again, Charles Lee is not necessarily the best company you want to keep. In hindsight, looking back at the American Revolution, Lee had already given Washington a lot of gruff, and gotten captured himself, and now here we are, at the Battle of Monmouth. Now, at this point, Henry Knox is the captain of artillery, like, he's Washington's chief of artillery, but in a fashion, Eliezer Oswald is number two in artillery because he's doing it for the second ranking general in the army, the highest ranking major general. So, here they go off to war, blah, 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 blah. And they are at the Battle of Monmouth. Now, the Battle of Monmouth is famous for Lee ordering a retreat and Washington seeing the people retreat as he approached with the main army and yelling at Lee in front of everyone and then Lee gets embarrassed, he gets court-martialed and resigns. What's interesting about Oswald is the part he plays in that retreat. You see, Lee was out there in the hot Jersey sun, sweating bullets, people dying a sunstroke and fighting the army. And then he sees... Oswald, his chief artillery guy, pushing a cannon in the wrong direction. And he rides over, and he's like, what are you doing? And he's like, this is broken. We're just trying to get it off the field so we can save it for another day. And Lee goes, oh, okay, sweet, get rid of it. And a few other officers down the way, they can't hear what's going on, but they see this conversation and then see Oswald, again, a really important figure in this section of the army retreating. And they think, oh, they're ordering retreat, let's retreat. And they start going. And then some other people see them going. And it turns into a disorganized retreat. And Lee, to his credit, realizes how difficult it's going to be to get everyone to stop retreating and instead decides to keep his men together and organizes uh, and orders an organized retreat. An orderly retreat was very important back then. Again, warfare was different back then, and they would... Moving together, keeping your men together, was very important. So Lee thought the best solution was to order this retreat. Moments later, he's getting cussed out in public and by George Washington. Clearly not the best decision. Was, I, I had never really read too much about Oswald before, and I did not realize he essentially accidentally ordered this retreat for Lee, or at least got it going disorganized on accident. Now, Oswald was... Oswald remained there. Because people started retreating, Oswald sees everything unfold and says, oh, I'm going to use my artillery to defend the retreating soldiers. And he did. And he would actually get accommodated because of his heroics at Monmouth following his actual accidental destruction of Charles Lee's career. Um, uh, he did, at the court-martial of Charles Lee, speak on his behalf. But because Lee was let go and because Oswald was like, if I did so good, give me a promotion, and he didn't get a promotion, he ends up leaving the army too. Don't get too mad at him. He, again, sustained a wound, was in prison for a year. He paid his dues as a patriot. Um, and then he goes on, he does several other jobs. He moves to Philadelphia for a while. Uh, actually, first he moves to Baltimore and works at a paper owned by um, uh, William Goddard, who I have not published a founder of the day yet. I've tried to start it a few times and just, he keeps falling off my plate. And he's on my list, hopefully sometime this week. Because William Goddard's sister... Mary Catherine Goddard was also a newspaper publisher. She took over for William when he left, and she's the first one to publish the Declaration of Independence with the names of the signers on it. 
and right at the bottom it says published by Mary Catherine Goddard. So the first time anyone in America read the names of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, the name Mary Catherine Goddard was printed right there. Fun fact, I really took the long way around there. But anyway, uh, Eliezer Oswald goes to Philly and starts his own paper, the Independent Gazetteer. I love the name Gazetteer. Uh, T-T-E-E. Tear. <laughs> anyway, uh, he becomes an anti-federalist, and he starts promoting a whole lot of anti-federalist stuff. As I said earlier, people start printing anti-federalist materials right away. He's one of them. In fact, uh, the Sentinel, I am going to write about soon, was a series of papers published under the pseudonym The Sentinel. Uh, it's alleged that he may have published one or two of these, but we can't really know, although I will talk about when I publish that who we do know about. So, Oswald, uh, he, he ends up going to France because the French war, the, 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 the um, French Revolution breaks out. So he decides to go repay his debt. The French helped us, I'll help them. And he goes, and he actually becomes an officer in the French army and leads an artillery department because he's pretty good at it. And he does good for a while, but then again, doesn't get a promotion. And he's given a special task by France, by Vir Virgines. Uh, and he goes to Ireland to act as a secret agent. Second secret agent of the day. Things are really, life's tying in today. He goes to France to act as a secret agent. I apologize. He goes to Ireland to act as a secret agent on behalf of France. And since he's an American, no one suspects him at all. Now we don't, I, I didn't really read too deeply into his findings. It's not like Ireland played a big role in the French Revolution, so he didn't come out with too much. Uh, eventually, he does return to the United States, but sadly, he sails to New York City, where much like Holt, he catches the yellow fever epidemic of 1798 and dies. And that is the story of Eliezer Oswald. I hope you enjoyed it. Let's see. Is there... No one got a... Oh, Matthew, uh, did he get sent to England as a prisoner? Um, uh, Oswald? Uh, no, I don't, I don't believe so. I actually didn't read where he went... But um, I, I don't remember anyone from Quebec getting sent to England. Uh, that would have been a lot of set, that would have been a, a lot of travel for. They captured a lot of people that day, and to put them all on boats and send them over would have been tough. I will look into that for you. I will write that down in my handy notebook I got now. Uh, Quebec prisoners. England? Question mark. I'll look up all the prisoners, not just him. Thank you so much for asking. Um, not a lot of chatter today. Not a lot of chatter. I guess uh, uh, some of our friends weren't able to make it. That's going to happen. That's all right. We'll forgive them. Um, if you do have any other questions, now's the time. We are less than an hour in. Ethan Allen was sent to England. Yes. Ethan Allen, they had a special anger about. Um, actually, it's funny you mentioned that. I had a conversation with Michael Troy recently of the Amrev podcast, who I had written an article saying Henry Lawrence was the only American kept in the Tower of London. Uh, and Michael pointed out he was under the impression that Ethan Allen was also at the Tower of London. Uh, and I, I need to look into it. I have yet to study that further. I will take Michael at his word. He is extremely well-researched. Um, I don't, again, I have not seen that officially written out, but part of it wouldn't surprise me, but part of it would. That is a good question, because they did take Ethan Allen. But, like I said, Ethan Allen was especially noteworthy at the time. He had been causing trouble between New Hampshire and New York for well before this. He's also the one who led an invasion of New York, which New York was... Occupied by the British real quick, they were very nervous about joining the revolution because they were super heavily loyalist. Uh, they would abstain from voting on the declaration until uh, the 15th. Actually, today's the anniversary of the day that instructions arrived in Philadelphia from New York telling its delegates, you may also vote for independence now. And so today's the day that the, the independence actually became uh, unanimous. <laughs> Cool, thank you so much. Uh, if, unless you guys have any other questions. Matthew, not a ton of people with us today. That's okay. These things are going to happen. Some days, 
you feel like nut and some days you don't is the rumor I've heard but thank you guys so much for watching uh, I get we'll call it today I feel like I put a lot out there it's a little bit different talk a lot about like French landowning and such <laughs> um, so you know we got to expand our horizons and and one of the things I love about founder of the day is that I can research things that I never really did before because it's you know that you know I tell my family I have to go to work for an hour two three and learn although as I've said it's usually when everyone else falls asleep I'm staying up late like reading about manners in New France in the 1750s because <laughs> it's fun so I had fun, I hope you had fun, and unless there's any other questions, I will say round bottom and call it a day. Thank you guys, and I will see you with another founder tomorrow.